I have a very difficult and a very fascinating job, serving as counselor and therapist to people with problems, troubled individuals, people in a good deal of distress. And I'd like to tell you something about my job. This is Dr. Carl Rogers, professor of psychiatry and psychology at the University of Wisconsin. For more than 30 years, I've been serving as a counselor to people with troubles. A long line of them, it seems to me. Some of them have been children, some adolescents, some parents, some older adults, and many college students. And as I think back over the years, it seems to me that many of them are people like you and me, people with problems in regard to their marriage or their family, their home, uh, their schoolwork, and so on. Others are people with more serious disturbances, people who have uh, had really serious troubles in life, who find themselves continually defeated by by life and its problems, and um, who who's, are quite desperately in need of help. Others are people with even more serious difficulties, people who have really withdrawn from the world and back into their own private world, where they've left life because it's been too difficult for them to face, and have uh, gradually gotten back into a... Um, world of their own where it's very difficult to to get at them. Now I think that um, there are some things that I've learned in these years of work that I would like to try to tell you about. I think that I've learned something about the kind of relationship that can be helpful in working with individuals and I'd like to share some of that with you. I might say, first of all, that I've had a good deal of unlearning to do, too. When I first uh, went into this work feeling quite proud of my newly gained psychological knowledge, I thought that I would surely be able to diagnose and understand the cause of a person's problems and try to explain that cause to him uh, and be of help to him in that way. Well, I found that I could often make a diagnosis of his difficulty. I think that in many instances I was correct. But I found that it didn't particularly help to try to explain to a person the cause of his difficulties. Then I also felt pleased with the fact that I would be able to make suggestions to them, that I would be able to uh, having understood the cause of their problem, to help an individual by giving him sound suggestions as to what he should do and the ways he should behave and the course of action he should follow. Well, I, I did that. And it seemed to me that at times it was quite satisfying to me to make those good suggestions. But again, I found that it did not help. People simply are not helped by advice. If they were, they would never have to come to a counselor. Because people with problems have had dozens of individuals giving them advice. They've had advice from their friends and their families and their lawyers and their doctors. If advice would help, no one would ever come to a counselor because they would already have had plenty of good advice. So I've gradually come to recognize that the most valuable kind of help I can give is the kind of psychological climate or psychological atmosphere that I can create. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Let me make it quite specific. Suppose that a person is coming to see me. This individual has made an appointment, has called and said that he has a problem he wants to talk to me about. He's coming for the first time. 
I used to feel that I would want a great deal of information about this person before I began to work with him. I thought I'd want a social case history. I'd like to know his, what his personal experience and his school experience and so on might be. I'd want the results of tests that might give me a picture of his personality characteristics. I thought I needed all that information in order to start work with him. As time has gone on, I feel less and less need of that kind of information. It's really not too important to me what brought him to his present state, because the only thing that really matters is the kind of relationship that we can form right now. And as I think about that and think about a person coming in for the first time, I think maybe I'll digress a moment, just a little bit uh, facetiously perhaps, and try and explain to you the instruments that are a part of my trade, if you want to call it that. They're all here, and I'll point them out to you. First of all, there's a chair. I do need a chair for my client. It has to be firm and uh, strong and comfortable. If it fulfills those requirements, I think it's adequate. Then, second, I use this tape recorder. Frequently, I want to make a recording of the interviews that I am holding because it helps me to go back afterward and listen to the interview and perhaps catch some of the feelings that I wasn't quite aware of at the time. It also helps me to see where I've made mistakes or perhaps I haven't understood adequately. It helps me to um, hear inflections and tones of voice that at the time I might not have caught because they were too subtle. So a recorder is a helpful instrument in my work. And then you may get a chuckle out of this, but the third instrument is a box of Kleenex. Because as men and women get deeply into their problems and as they get below the surface and begin to uh, deal with the things that really trouble them inside, it's the rare person who doesn't shed at least a few tears at some time or other. Well, those are three of the instruments. The fourth instrument is me. I have to face the fact that I'm the instrument which is most important in my work. So, what about me? The chair doesn't very often fail. I've never had one collapse. The box of Kleenex, that always stands up, providing I have enough. The recorder usually functions adequately, though I, I've had it go wrong. But I'm the one that I'd better think most about. It's my attitudes which are most important. And the real question in my mind when a person comes into my office is, will I be able to create this climate which can be of help to him? I never can be sure, but I can at least share with you some of the things that I feel go to make up that psychological climate of, of helpfulness, the kind of relationship that seems to be effective in working with people. I think the um, very first element in that is that I find that when I'm of the most help, those are the times when I'm, I am genuine, when I'm real. One word that I like to describe it is when I'm transparent. When, when it seems as though there is nothing, nothing hidden from this person that I'm working with. Now, what I mean by that is that whatever I'm experiencing is really known to me. It's open to me. I know what I'm feeling. And I would like for any feelings of mine that are really relevant to this relationship to be transparent in the relationship, and to be known to the person I'm working with. What are some of the feelings that I'm likely to have? Well, as I work with individuals, gradually I come to care. I really come to care in regard to this person. And I'd like for that to show. Another feeling that certainly is very often real in me is one of compassion because sometimes individuals have had lives of 
terrible loneliness and real, real torment. And I do feel compassion toward them. And I'd like that to show. And then one thing that is almost certain to be present in me is interest. People are fascinating. And I, and I am interested in them as individuals. And I'd like that to show. And then I feel a desire to, to really understand. Understand them in a way that, that seems to catch their point of view. And I'd like that to show. But then, suppose I have other feelings. Suppose I feel somewhat bored with this uh, individual. Well, I'm not proud of it, but I'd like that to show too. Or, suppose I feel resentment. I don't very often resent my clients, but if I do, or when I do, I would want that to be evident to the person too. The point is that I don't believe a therapist can be helpful to another person unless he can really be himself. And being himself means letting any of his real feelings be present in the relationship. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to talk a lot about these feelings that I've mentioned. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm pretty quiet in an interview. I don't really say a great deal. But I would like it for my feelings to uh, really be visible and evident to this other individual. I want to be real and open within myself so that I communicate just one message. Now that may sound a little strange, but often we communicate more than one message and that's very confusing. Suppose I resent the fact that a client of mine is taking too much time, but I cover it up. Well, then he hears one message, but he's actually receiving another message too because he may sense my resentment. I think we sense lots of things that we don't really uh, understand easily. Or suppose I really care about this person, but I cover that up by trying to take a strictly professional, cool attitude and I don't let it show. Well then, too, the client is getting two messages. On the one hand, there's this coolness. On the other hand, perhaps he does sense a, a warmth in me. I, I would like it to be just one message. It may seem a little odd to you that I give so much stress to uh, the therapist being real, even when his feelings are not those that uh, he would be very proud of. I think perhaps I can illustrate the reason for that by telling you a story. There was a counselor in our staff who one day received a message that one of his children had been hurt. And naturally, he was greatly upset, and his first thought was that he would cancel the rest of his appointments for that day and go home and find out how serious the trouble was. And then he got to thinking about his next client. This was a client who came from a long distance, way out of town. And the counselor thought, I can't do that to him. He's come a long ways. I'll, I'll see this one person, and then I'll go home. And so he had the client come in. He tried to listen to him. He tried to be sympathetic and understanding. But all the time, his mind was really on his child and wondering how serious the accident had been. And the interview didn't go well. And finally, he realized this can't go on. So he said to the client, I'm, I'm very sorry, I keep trying to listen to you, but I really am not adequately paying attention to you today, and the reason is that uh, my little boy has been hurt, and I don't know how bad it is, and I keep thinking about that all the time. And the client sat back in his chair and said, Oh, it's you. I thought it was me. I don't know whether you get the real point of that story, but you see, when the counselor was not real, and he was trying to put up a a front of understanding and sympathy that he wasn't really feeling. The client sensed that something was wrong, but then directed all that feeling against himself and thought he must be the one who was doing something wrong. So it was a great relief to him to, dis to when the therapist became real instead of trying to put up a false front. So as I say, the, the first element in this relationship is that I want to be real, I want to be genuine, I want to be transparent. Now,
second thing that I find of a great deal of help in working with my clients is if I prize the individual, if I feel a real liking and acceptance and warmth toward this person. Here's a wife, let's say, who's full of bitterness toward her husband, uh, making all kinds of complaints, some of them pretty extreme complaints. Can I really be acceptant of this individual? Can I really accept her as she is, with all her bitterness and hate? Or here's a man who's obviously bright, and yet who sits there telling me that how completely inadequate he is, that he really can't do a thing, that he is utterly impotent to, to meet life on any reasonable terms. Can I accept a person like that? Can I accept him as he is? Or here's a man who's stepping out with a woman not his wife, uh, going against the morals of the community. Can I accept that person as he is? It's that kind of question which continually comes to mind. Do I accept a person in the way in which he really uh, presents himself, or do I form a judgment about him? I think that acceptance means a willingness for a person to be separate. Now, it's, it's very, very hard for most of us to let another individual be separate. We want him to be someone like me. We want to um, judge him. We want to say things like, well, that's wrong. Or we want to say, well, I had an experience like that, but I, I wasn't depressed by it. Uh, we continually try to see him through our eyes instead of letting him be a separate individual with his own feelings, his own attitudes, and his own behavior. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my experience, it is that I want to value him as he is, with the potentialities he has to be sure, but I want to value and prize and accept him as he is. A separate person with the right to his own feelings and his own behavior and his own way of seeing things. And that last brings me to the third element in the kind of relationship I want to create. Can I understand this person sensitively, accurately? Can I understand him with empathy, which means getting inside his world and seeing his world from his own point of view? Can I really sense the flavor of his feelings and the attitudes that he's talking about? Here's a bright, attractive married woman who uh, tells me that she finds life so hopeless that she often considers suicide. Can I really understand how, with all her good qualities, nevertheless, life can seem that way to her? That's, that's what I mean by really uh, understanding from within. Can I see how remote and alone and hopeless she feels in spite of what all the rest of us might think of as very positive elements in her life. Or a boy at the state hospital who gives me a confused story about property assessments of all things and tries to tell me how property is assessed and once it's assessed, it stays that way for a long, long time even though the property keeps changing. And as I listen and listen to him talk about that, I begin to sense the meaning that he's trying to tell me that though things remain the same on the surface, yet things are changing underneath. And I'd like to really sense the way in which that seems to him. And through his garbled talk to get the personal meaning that he's trying to communicate. Now, it's simply incredibly difficult for most of us to simply understand without judging. To, to see the other person's point of view without making judgments about it, we have absolutely no experience of that kind in our social conversation or in our ordinary life. When you listen to this talk or when you listen to your friends speak, you immediately begin to form judgments about it. 
You don't listen to try to get the other person's point of view. You try to make judgments of it from your point of view. That's why I find that in training counselors, it's terribly difficult to get them simply to be willing to understand from within and to stop at that point. I think people who do listen and understand and who don't judge are deeply valued in any community where they live. They get to be known as people who, who help. People ask, why does this help? Why does just, does, if you just understand a person, doesn't that confirm him in what he's doing? Doesn't it make him uh, settled in his problems? No, that's not so. If I understand a mother who's rejecting her child, or an errant husband, or someone of that sort, and can understand him accurately and accept him completely, then that creates in him the, the most positive basis for change that I know. That's the kind of climate which permits a person to change and makes it likely that he will change. Whereas without any understanding and without any acceptance, individuals are often frozen into the very behavior patterns which they wish they could leave behind. So I would like to be a very sensitive instrument in uh, understanding and sensing just the flavor and meaning of what this person is trying to tell me and letting him know that I do understand that and that I sense how it, how it feels to him. Now a fourth element in this climate I'm trying to describe, and this is the first element I have spoken of that has to do with my client is the question of whether the client can perceive in me some of these attitudes that I've spoken about. He doesn't have to perceive them all the time, but it is the question of whether he can at times perceive me as acceptant and understanding and real. If he does perceive me in that way, and if I have those attitudes, then in my experience, constructive change in this other person is almost inevitable. He will move and change in ways that will help him to resolve his problems and will make him a socially more constructive person. But sometimes that's very, very difficult. A one girl that I'm working with feels that what I'm really trying to do is to find out how stupid she is. And even though that's not my intent or my attitude, yet that is the way that she sees me. Or I think of a man whom I'm working with at the present time too, who says to me, you don't really care. To you, I'm just a guinea pig. You don't really care at all about me. Well, uh, he's sure that I have no concern about how tormented he is. And yet, actually, in time, perhaps he will be able to sense the attitude which I do hold toward him. Or there's another girl at the state hospital with whom I'm working who thinks that she hears me calling her bad names. Now, in other words, she doesn't perceive that I care, doesn't perceive that I have any regard for her. And yet, at times she does. And little by little, we're getting to the point where she can sense in me some of the attitudes that will make it possible to, uh, for her to change and grow and be helped. So, even if I've achieved some of the attitudes that I have tried to talk about, I can't be sure that they'll be perceived by my client. Especially, I can't be sure that they will be immediately perceived by people who feel hurt and lonely and tormented and unloved. Well, I think those are the conditions which, if they exist, almost guarantee that a person will be helped. Now, am I just talking in very personal terms? Is it just a fantasy? Or are there facts that would back up this point of view? Well, I think you might be interested in one research study that I could tell you about. 
Dr. Halkides at the University of Chicago took small bits of recorded interviews from cases that had been helped a great deal and also from cases who had received relatively little help in working with a counselor. And um, these various bits she had judged by judges who listened to them, who knew nothing about the cases. They simply listened to these brief excerpts from the interviews. And then first they would rate what they listened to as to whether the counselor was genuine. Was he being real? And then they would listen to it again and they would give a rating as to the degree of warmth and acceptance and positive regard that he felt for the client. And then they would listen still a third time and rate it as to the accuracy of his understanding of the client's meanings as they were being expressed. And she found that there was a clear association between these qualities in the therapist and the degree of success in, in the client. In other words, the more the therapist um, had these attitudes that I've tried to describe, the more likely it was that the person would find himself growing, would find his problems resolved, and so on. So these attitudes that I've described as being distilled out of my experience are also being confirmed by hard-headed research. Now in closing, I want to read you something from a paper I recently wrote. I wanted to sum up what it feels like to be a counselor, to be a therapist. And here's what I wrote. To the counselor, it's a new venture in relating. He feels, here is this other person, my client. I'm a little afraid of him, afraid of the depths in him, as I am a little afraid of the depths in myself. Yet as he speaks, I begin to feel a respect for him, to feel my kinship to him. I sense how frightening his world is for him, how tightly he tries to hold it in place. I would like to sense his feelings, and I would like him to know that I understand his feelings. I would like him to know that I stand with him in his tight, constricted little world, and that I can look upon it unafraid. Perhaps I can make it a safer world for him. I would like my feelings in this relationship with him to be as clear and transparent as possible, so that they're a discernible reality for him, to which he can return again and again. I realize that his own fears may make him perceive me at times as uncaring, as rejecting, as an intruder, as one who doesn't understand. I want fully to accept these feelings in him, and yet I hope also that my own real feelings will show through so clearly that in time he can't fail to perceive them. Most of all, I want him to encounter in me a real person. I don't need to be uneasy as to whether my own feelings are therapeutic. What I am and what I feel are good enough to be a basis for therapy if I can transparently be what I am and what I feel in relationship to him. Then perhaps he can be what he is, openly and without fear.